all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you... <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth. I don't... I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, good evening, it's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. Last year's record-breaking net migration figures have turned out to be an underestimate. 139,000 more people came than previously stated, according to the Office for National Statistics. Revised figures for 2022, plus a provisional 672,000 for 2023. Following the Chancellor's autumn statement, the government's energy regulator, Ofgem, has today announced that the energy price cap will be increased further tightening the purse strings of the British public. How could this be remedied? The disaffection with traditional politics has produced two surprise results in a week. Argentina and the Netherlands have both this week elected people often described as far-right, but certainly eclectic ones, and it's raised eyebrows on their stances on immigration. But on the basis of our migration figures, is this something the UK should be concerned about? R and a literary treat to finish off your Thursday evening. Renowned author and historian Lord Roberts of Belgravia joins me to discuss his biography of one of the world's most infamous leaders, Napoleon Bonaparte, and why this figure from centuries long ago still intrigues millions today. State of the Nation starts now. We'll also be joined by a venerable panel of Nigel Nelson, GB News' senior political commentator and journalist and former UKIP deputy chairman, Suzanne Evans. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the program. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's time for the news of the day with Theo Chikomba. I'm Theo Chikomba in the GB newsroom. There are calls for calm as protesters clash with police after three children and a woman were stabbed in Dublin. A number of vehicles have been set on fire with protesters firing flares and fireworks at the police cordon. It's after police confirmed a five-year-old girl is among the victims and is said to be in a serious condition. Two other children and a woman are also being treated in hospital. Police say they are not treating the incident as terror-related. Earlier, Irish Police Superintendent Liam Gerty described the extent of some of the injuries. Five casualties have been taken to hospitals in the Dublin region. These casualties include three young children, an adult female and an adult male. One girl aged five years has sustained serious injuries and is currently receiving emergency medical treatment in CHI Temple Street. One boy aged five years and a girl aged six years who received less serious injuries were brought to CHI Crumlin for treatment. The boy has since been discharged from CHI Crumlin. Thirteen hostages held by Hamas are due to be released from Gaza as a temporary ceasefire with the terror group is to begin tomorrow. 
A spokesperson from the Qatar Foreign Ministry said the first group of civilians will be released at 4 o'clock. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary has met with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on a visit to the country. Lord Cameron said he wanted to see for himself the communities affected by last month's Hamas attacks and he hopes that all involved in the truce deal will make it happen. Officers are appealing for dash cam footage following a crash that killed four teenagers in North Wales. Jevon Hurst, Harvey Owen, Wilf Fitchett and Hugo Morris were on a camping trip in North Wales. Their bodies were recovered on Tuesday after a car was found overturned and partially submerged in water. North Wales Police says it appears to have been a tragic accident. Police are asking for anyone who has been travelling on the A4085 in Gwynedd between Sunday and Tuesday for information. Downing Street says more measures could be introduced to curb net migration. It comes as new figures showed that illegal immigration to the UK hit a new record of 745,000 in the year to December. Most suggest estimates uh, that immigration is now slowing, while the number of people leaving the UK is going up. Energy bills are expected to rise after the energy regulator announced a 5% increase to the price cap. From January, the average household will pay around £94 more uh, uh, over the course of the year. Ofgem says the increase is mostly driven by market instability and global events. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now it's back to Jacob. First of all, an apology. Along with many other Tory MPs, I stood in 2010 on a manifesto to cut migration to the tens of thousands. We have failed, and it is now cumulatively in the millions. The Office for National Stati Statistics recorded a record-breaking figure of 606,000 for net migration in 2022. But the reality is worse. The 2022 figure has been revised upwards to an even more unsustainable 745,000. That's an addition of 139,000 people that the government hasn't accounted for. The Home Secretary today suggested that he remains completely committed to reducing levels of legal migration. Figures from the ONS show that in two years, over 1.4 million people have entered the country net, with today's provisional figure for 2023 even higher than the provisional figure for 2022. These statistics suggest that the population of England and Wales is growing at its fastest rate since 1962. According to YouGov, British people believe that immigration is one of the top three most important issues facing this country, and it has profound economic and social consequences. Economically, GDP per capita, that is the amount on average we individually contribute, is falling this year and growing more slowly in future years than GDP itself because of this increase in the population. The per capita bit is going up in terms of the ratio. In spite of this, last month, Home Office forecasts predicted that foreign worker visas for skilled jobs will double within the next five years. And we need to look at who is coming here. In the health and social care sector, for example, 282,742 visas were issued in the year to June. Over half, 151,774 of those were to dependents. In addition, 378,000 foreign students came into the UK, of whom 136,000 were dependents. But what about our own labour force? There are 1.27 million unemployed and 5 million on out-of-work benefits, who surely we should be trying to bring back into the workforce. We don't need more immigration to fill our labour market. We have millions of people who could, and indeed should, be filling these jobs. But the system militates against them because in shortage occupations, domestic wages may be undercut by 20% for immigrant labour, making our own poor poorer and giving industries an incentive to say that there are shortages because it's a route to cutting their costs. And I'm afraid it doesn't seem to me as if the government is taking this as seriously as it ought to. It's much easier to deal with legal migration 
than it is to deal with the much smaller number of illegal crossings in small boats. There are no human rights considerations. It can be done by administrative action. What is currently happening is, I'm afraid, frankly, embarrassing. Of course, I want to hear from you, mailmog at gbnews.com, but I'm delighted to be joined now by Carl Williams, Deputy Research Director of the Centre for Policy Studies, specialising uh, in immigration, and, of course, my brilliant panel, the journalist and former UKIP Deputy Chairman, Suzanne Evans, and GB News's very own senior political commentator, uh, Nigel Nelson. Well, thank you all for, for coming. I mean, we promised tens of thousands when we came in in 2010, and here we are at 1.4 million over two years. This isn't a great success, is it? No, I mean, absolutely not. And it's interesting that one of the baselines at the moment is the 2019 manifesto, we will, overall numbers will come down. Um, and we now know that the 2019 net migration figure was about 183,000. Um, and with net migration last year, 745,000. Uh, to get below that, that's a 75% cut. And these are policy choices, aren't they? That, that we're no longer bound by the European Union. Uh, we can set the conditions for immigration that we choose. We've set them so that very large numbers can come in. Yes, this is true, and I, I don't think anyone deliberately set out to do so. But the system, the system has become calibrated in such a way that the thresholds are very low. Uh, we have the shortage occupation list, which, incidentally, the Migration Advisory Committee now has suggested we ought to abolish or heavily reform. Um, we have a higher education strategy, which is predicated on making our universities an export industry. Uh, and actually, what that means is making it a, a massive import industry for students coming to this country. Yeah, um, Suzanne, who used to be um, with UKIP, uh, indeed very senior yeah, within UKIP, they've campaigned consistently for controlling mm. migration. It must be absolutely infuriating to see a nominally right-wing government allowing migration to be Yeah, I control. think we look back, you know, at the 2010 manifesto, OK, David Cameron was in coalition then as Prime Minister, but uh, there was a pledge to bring down migration to the tens of thousands. Now, presumably, that's under 100,000. And here we are now importing a city the size of Liverpool every year. I mean, there's, there's no other way to look at that but 13 years of Conservative failure. And also, it's completely anti-democratic. You apologised at the top of this programme. It deserves an apology. You know, the idea that the people were told that immigration would come down and here we are at such record levels is, is shocking. The other thing I think that I, I, I took from the figures was the amount of people leaving this country. So 18% of those people who were emigrating from Britain are British passport holders. They're British people. Now, why are they going? Um, are we losing a huge amount of our own talent as well? So I think both ways, it's an abject failure. Nigel, do you worry about this? Or is it just something that's economically beneficial and part of the globalisation of the world and our voters should be relaxed about it? No, I think, th I think that the, the figure should be brought down. I don't think you should put a cap on it. Um, what you need is people coming into the country that the economy needs. So there are ways of doing that. You've mentioned the, the, the fact that um, even after 13 years, the government have done nothing about uh, employers being able to pay 20% less for um, foreign workers, which obviously encourages them to, to bring foreign workers in. We have an autumn statement yesterday which talked about how we want to get people from welfare into work. The two things don't marry up, so why haven't the government done something about that? Equally, the points-based system should be much more flexible. So, at the moment, 10 points if you speak English, uh, uh, 20 points if you um, uh, have a job offer, another 10 points for a PhD. What should happen there is that should be designed in a way to have the people that we want coming in to fill the jobs that can't be filled at home. Thank you very much. Well, we've got a special guest that I want to discuss this with, Ishmael Lee South, the director of the Salem Project, which is a BME youth uh, and community initiative. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, it, it, with Good evening. Th these figures, do you have any concern that the numbers are simply too great? It's not about the individual migrant who are hard-working, ambitious people who want to make a better life, which is thoroughly admirable, but the numbers are so large. Yes, the numbers are so large is because most of the migrants are fleeing countries that have been destabilized and that are run by criminally corrupt governments. So, for example, Tony Blair Foundation, who generate millions and millions of pounds every year. If it was up to me, I would say 
The taxpayer should not be paying for this. The Tony Blair Foundation should be paying for this. A large percentage of the economic migrants, if you look at the statistics and the records according to the government, come from Iraq, Syria and Afghanistan, which were destabilized by the Tony Blair government. OK, so we need to make the Tony Blair Foundation put up some of the cost. Then we have numerous charities like Save the Children Fund. We have Oxfam, UNICEF, um, the Red Cross, Islamic Relief, Muslim Aid and many other charities in Penny Appeal, which could economically, financially support an offshore, uninhabited island place where we could administer um, where we could do vetting and where we could process the immigrants that are coming. Yes. As we but, know, but, there are but, hundreds sorry, of but, uninhabited islands around Europe that okay, we are not but, utilising. But look, this is, this, this is very important, but today we're talking about legal migration. We're not talking about people coming as refugees and seeking asylum. We're saying people who are coming because they've got enough points, they're allowed to come here, a lot of them are coming from stable countries, stable friendly nations. And it's that Sorry, number I that I'm concerned you. about. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. I was saying that Sorry, we're talking about... You. Can you hear me now? No, well, I'm sorry. We seem to have lost the line, but thank you so much to Ishmael. But I'll go back to my, my panel. Um, I mean, Nigel, you were making the point about the control we have, that we set out the points you need. We can change that overnight. Mm. That doesn't even need primary legislation. No, I just think that that, that, that needs to be more flexible. So you respond to uh, what the economic conditions are. So, for instance, most of this uh, rise in migration has been brought about uh, by work visas, the health and care visa for uh, people who want to work in care homes, where there are one in ten vacancies. That seems to be sensible to bring those people in. Um, but it has an effect on society, doesn't it, that the economic effect I've discussed, but there's also a societal effect. If you have very large numbers who come in and they don't integrate, and it takes time for communities to integrate. And, and I think that's been part of the problem as well. We've not had any requirements for migrants to integrate into British society. In fact, quite the opposite. We've had this policy, and I'm talking about a policy of multiculturalism as opposed to a multicultural society, when immigrants have been encouraged to come here and carry on in exactly the same way as they might expect to do so in their home countries. And that's been massively destabilising. I also must argue with you, Nigel, when you talked about the need for people, for instance, to come into the care sector. The answer to that problem is to pay our care workers a heck of a lot better. We, the oh, incredibly absolutely. difficult we job can go, We absolutely. can go back to our down-the-line guest. So, um, Ishmael, thank you very much. Uh, what I was asking about was the issue of this being about legal migration... I, I get yes. your point on illegal migration and people fleeing um, destabilised countries, but this migration is people from stable countries who are coming here lawfully, but just in such large numbers. And I wonder whether you think there should be a limit on the numbers at all. I believe personally, if, for example, Britain can deal with this, the large skills gap shortage and labour shortage that we have in the UK, we wouldn't have a larger request for immigration, because the immigration that in, that we have in this country is very is very much championed by large industries in the country, because unfortunately, amongst our young people today, we have a massive snowflake problem, where a lot of our young people, aged between sixteen and twenty five, many of them are very good and what and doing good work and studying, but unfortunately, there's a large percentage of them who are not working, don't want to work, are lazy. And we need to get them a kick up the backside, of course, politely, and I'm figuratively speaking, not, not, not physically, of course, by introducing a reformed vocational um, national service. And I believe once this, happen, once this happens, we, um, the immigration can be reduced. But also, because David Cameron has been made the new foreign secretary, I do believe we need to address the corruption of countries where many of the immigrants are coming from because many people are coming here because there's not lack of opportunities. The government ministers in many of these countries are embezzling their government funds in European banks. Okay. So if we were to okay. deal with this, we would de reduce um, immigration.
We're going to have to go to our sponsors in a moment, but thank you so much, Trish Mel. I love the idea of a very polite kick up the backside. I think that's <laughs> wonderfully elegantly put, so thank you for that, and thank you to my panel, who we'll be seeing again in a moment. Uh, we're going to be talking about energy bills on the rise. Is there a solution? Um, and then we're going to be talking about Napoleon blown apart, as he was in the end. Ha! Huh. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it you? It's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I'm still Jacob Rees-Mogg, and this is State of the Nation. We've been discussing the net migration figures released today, and you've been sending in your thoughtful views. Robert says, the immigration figures are shocking and unsustainable. Taking control of our borders has become a comedy show. And Neil, I fear that today's catastrophic immigration figures could be the final nail in the coffin for the Conservative Party, not just for next year's election, but for the next two or three elections. Well, I certainly hope not. Um, just to warn you, there is some news potentially coming from Ireland, so we may suddenly have to disappear and talk to somebody else. Um, so if that happens, you've been warned, and forewarned is forearmed. Um, on the day after the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, delivered his autumn statement, energy regulator Ofgem has announced today that the energy price cap will rise in January, resulting in households paying, on average, 5% more for their energy bills amounting to a total of £1,928 a year on average. Ofgem has said that the price increase is due to higher wholesale costs for electricity and gas faced by suppliers. The international wholesale energy market has been erratic recently because of the Israel-Hamas war, as well as the industrial action at gas production plants in Australia. This news puts the spotlight back on our need to reconsider our own energy production in this country. The Chancellor promised yesterday to build domestic sustainable energy 
and shared his long-term plans for billions of pounds of spending over the next decade. He also went on to say that it's taking too long for clean energy businesses to access the electricity grid. But renewable energy is remarkably expensive and it will take a long time to get. We need to be extracting as much as we can from the North Sea and possibly even fracking. In terms of renewable energy, the government has just increased the price it's offering for offshore wind projects to £176 per megawatt hour, nearly double the price that you get for Hinkley Point, which is quite expensive, nuclear power at £92.50, which compares to the spot gas price, which is inflated because of the recent turmoil and because we're not fracking anyway, of £82.44. So the gas spot price is much cheaper than nuclear or indeed offshore wind. So it seems to me that the roads do leave us back to fracking and using the energy beneath our feet. But joining me now is Simon Nash, Managing Director of Green Oil UK, as well as my panel, who you know well. Well, thank you for, for coming in. Um, these plus strike prices for offshore wind are extremely high, aren't they? Well, they are, but I do think climate change is important. If we're going to make uh, young people do maths until 18, uh, the least we can do is look after the, the planet for them. Uh, and it is a bit higher, but actually with the volatility of gas prices uh, due to Putin's wars and, uh, well, it all comes from dubious countries, most of the oil and gas, um, I think the time is to go towards renewable energy. And I would say that I'm in favour of nuclear energy as well, um, and most environmentalists are. And renewables and uh, renewables form over 40% of our power, up from 2% uh, under Tony Blair. I mean, I'm certainly in favour of, of nuclear power, but with renewables, you're still going to need some gas supply on standby for when the wind isn't blowing and when the sun isn't shining. If we're going to be using gas anyway, isn't it sensible to use our own gas? And when we're sitting on trillions of cubic feet of it, extracting that, the shale gas, which America has done so successfully. Yeah, well, I'd argue in America it wasn't successful. Um, it caused a lot of pollution, uh, people having their tap water with gas in it. But that's not true. You know that th those stories have all been debunked. There's uh, never been gas coming out of taps. It's just not accurate. OK, well, I didn't know that. Sorry, but no, I did. Yeah, that's OK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, aqu aquifers have been polluted, and I, I do think the aquifers, the, the water stored underground in the UK is a priority to preserve. And secondly, I think uh, having gas on standby is not the long-term solution with renewables. You can store renewable energy by turning electricity into hydrogen, by having giant flywheels, well, for example. I'm very excited by hydrogen as mm. a long-term possibility, but we're still quite a long time away from that. Uh -huh. And it's therefore using gas as effectively as a transition fuel at low cost, because American electricity prices are about half those in the UK, and the American economy has been growing, as you will know, much more strongly than our economy has. I don't think the two are related. Um, around 40% of UK energy comes from renewables and about 25% from nuclear. And again, it was about 2% uh, a decade or two ago under the previous administration. Therefore, um, I don't think the relationship between cheap energy and economic growth is, is a firm one. And, and actually, growth from renewable energy has been a good thing. Energy prices have always been cheaper in America, largely because they, they tax them less. And arguably, it results to inefficiency. And again, in the UK, we have shops leaving their doors open with the heating on, people at home not wearing jumpers and just having the heating on. Actually, maybe we need more efficiency and we have an inefficient housing stock. People should be using secondary glazing and, and making these fixes to, uh, to reduce energy consumption. That's the way forward. N Nigel, you're very sympathetic to this view, aren't you? I the, am. The, but <laughs> £176 per megawatt hour, more than um, double the gas price, but nearly double the nuclear price. And nuclear is not cheap. Yeah, and, the, and the, the, the more renewables we have, the price will go down. But unfortunately, that's not true. With offshore wind, the price has just gone up. The government's well, just put the strike now, price but, up but, by 66%. But if we actually... Um, I mean, if, for instance, if you take Labour's plan that uh, Jeremy Hunt rubbished yesterday, yeah, the rightly. 28 billion that they want to actually spend on, on green energy, that will bring prices down. The other thing that would bring prices down, which I'm sorry that Keir Starmer has now shied away from, uh, is nationalising the, um, uh, the power industry. Which I know, I'm sure you don't agree with. No, I don't. Do, because but more, it, how would that possibly bring? But it, takes, down? it just simply takes the profit margin out of, uh, out of supplying public services. It, seem, it seems to me that anything that is actually for the public good, a public utility, a public mm. service, should be in uh, public hands. But the profit margin and competition drives lower prices. 
Well, stay, stay, the, where, where does the, the argument state, over capitalism well, yeah, that's right, basically? That's right. yeah. But, but I, I, mean, I admire your frankness in saying you want to go back to Clause 4. Well, I mean, a lot of those energy suppliers are just bill takers. You get Ecotricity, the ones producing renewable energy. A lot of these so-called uh, you know, free market um, energy suppliers, they're just issuing energy bills. I mean, it's ridiculous. They don't even issue paper bills and take checks anymore. They're just glorified order takers, and maybe the government could cut that out. But in some way. actually, it's innovation in the supply and in billing that has reduced prices for consumers. That's been very important. Um, Suzanne, these prices are very high. They're and, ridiculous. And um, but but as, as you know, Jacob, the last auction round for offshore wind um, failed, failed completely because nobody could afford to actually put the infrastructure in for the price the government was offering. So obviously the price had to go up. But I think for me, what, what, what really annoys me about this is that it's this push towards net zero that nobody's costed, nobody how much knows it's going to cost. It Really, the technology isn't there, the infrastructure isn't there, yet we're all being paying, what is it, 12% extra on our bills to fund this? And, and yet millions of us are living in fuel poverty. And yet the prices still keep going up. Interestingly, Ofgem today, I, I have to say, we need to look at Ofgem. It's been a complete failure. It was originally, I think, brought in in 2018 to try and get prices down because everyone felt they were being ripped off by energy energy companies. But it's now 70% higher, very nearly, um, th than what we were paying back in 2018. The whole thing's been a complete failure. Our energy policy is a total mess. I agree with you. We should be fracking. We should be looking at nuclear. We should be keeping with oil and gas and arguably coal as well until we actually have the ability to use these new technologies, which everyone has to support, but to use them in a, in a way that's and, possible. And keeping energy. prices down. I'll say a word prices in defence of Ofgem yeah. because... Um, my former diary secretary went to be the chief executive's assistant, and so I know there's at least one brilliant person <laughs> working in Ofgem. Anyway, thank you to Simon and my panel. Uh, do let me know how this price increase will affect you. Coming up, what lessons can we learn from the Dutch election? Plus, is the FA right not to light up the Wembley Arch for humanitarian causes in future? Um, I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, 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 you? <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's your new teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs>
I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Welcome back. Um, before the break, I asked you to let me know how the off-gen price cap increase will affect you. And Timothy says, pretty bluntly, the government needs to do more in supporting families already struggling in this cost-of-living crisis. And Nicola says price increases from off-gen will hit struggling families more. Earlier today, the results of the Dutch election were counted, and the outcome has suggested that Gert Wilders has won the majority of votes and may, may be on course to become the next Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Wilders' success joins a growing trend seen in recent months and years of unusual governments and leaders performing strongly in elections. Look at Argentina, for instance, where Javier Millet has recently won the election, and to Italy, where Giorgio Maloney is Prime Minister. Or even France, where Emmanuel Macron, which often gets forgotten, set up his own party before becoming the president. This is partly caused by disconnection between the governed, who do not trust the old parties, and the governing. In the Netherlands and Italy, immigration was the central issue. So given today's news about our own uncontrollable net migration statistics, is this a sign that the UK could be heading in a similar direction and turning towards parties that can offer tough action? Well, with me now is my distinguished panel, the journalist and former UKIP deputy chairman, Suzanne Evans, and GB News's very own Nigel Nelson. Um, Suzanne, I mean, UKIP to an extent did this mm. and was the breakthrough party and we got Brexit. Mm. But if you look at what's happening in other countries, People aren't very satisfied with the incumbent traditional parties, are they? No, well, I think it's interesting. We've been talking about immigration earlier in the programme. This is not just a problem in Britain. This is a problem across Europe, and we've seen that, as you mentioned, in Italy. We've also had Viktor Orban in Hungary. This is something that is really affecting people at a quite visceral level, I think. And I do wonder also, with, with the Netherlands elections, whether we've seen the um, pro-Palestine marches as well that have perhaps fuelled his anti Islam um, uh, policies, which he, he no doubt has. You know, he wants to he wants to ban mosques. He wants to ban the Quran and the wearing of the hijab in government spaces. He's got a very radical agenda, and you might not agree with that agenda, but it's obviously touched a nerve in a certain section of the population. But it's no surprise that we should be seeing this happening. I don't think um, there's a massive frustration. We're being more and more governed by super national organisations. This is what the Brexit Exit vote was all about really. It was about taking back control from an anti-democratic European Union. Um, there are other supranational organisations as well, the World Health Organisation, the UN flexing its muscles, uh, the European courts. Um, people are fed up. They feel that they don't have a say anymore, that their vote doesn't matter at the ballot box. And even the parties that they do vote for, going back to immigration, they vote for parties that mm. promise to shut immigration down or minimise immigration, and they don't. No, Nigel, are we protected by first-past-the-post, which makes it so much harder for um, a figure like Wilders to break through? Yes, thank goodness. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it's one of, the, one of the greatest things about first-past-the-post. It's not hugely democratic, but I think that Suzanne's party back in 2015 would be looking at something like 80-odd um, MPs if you'd have proportional representation, mm. because that was the 15% of the vote that UKIP were enjoying then. Mm. Yes, it does protect us from that. I also think we go in cycles. So we've had the populist uh, cycle with uh, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. We seem to be going towards a right-wing cycle at the moment. You've mentioned Viktor Orban, um, Giorgio Maloney in, in Italy, and now um, uh, Holland as well. But aren't they populists rather than specifically right-wing, that they are responding to voters' concerns about specific issues and running with those? And you've had the Farmers' Party in Holland suddenly did very well. Now you've got Wilders doing very well. 
and it's tapping into a general malaise, discontent in Western politics? Well, it feels like with, some, with, with someone like Gert Wilders is actually tapping into a kind of racism. Um, I mean, he seems to be backing off the idea of banning uh, Islamic schools and mosques and, and uh, the Quran. Um, but, a, but that was in his manifesto, and that seems to have actually attracted people. And, and now, uh, suddenly, the Holland is horrified with what they've got as a result. He probably won't be prime minister. Yeah, that's at the a end fair point. He probably won't become prime minister because. Um, yeah. They spend weeks now organising um, a well, coalition. That, and, I, think, yes. I, think, I think the last Dutch government took 271 days to arrive at who was going to form yeah. the cabinet and be the prime minister because they have such a, an extreme sort of sort of proportional representation system. Because only to Israel. But it took so <laughs> yeah. long to well, do and so. Well, Belgium, which be once prime went for every year. Very soon, but but there's no doubt about it. He has tapped into something, and this idea of being right wing or left wing, I've, I've long said well, that whether somebody criticises you of being far right really depends. On their perspective, um, well, the, the, as opposed to what you actually think. Before we go on, it gives me an opportunity to quote Canning, who sent back from trade negotiations with um, the Dutch the following cipher message. In matters of commerce, the fault of the Dutch is offering too little and asking too much. The French are with equal advantage content, so we slap on Dutch bottoms just 20%. And I just can't imagine <laughs> any minister of the Crown sending back such a witty message from any would. trade negotiations. <laughs> anyway, um, moving on to the Football Association, uh, and that's Association Football Association, I suppose, has faced criticism for its failure to illuminate the arch at Wembley Stadium in response to the Israel tax. Questions have been raised regarding the FA's apparent inconsistency in choosing not to light the arch after the Israel tax. Many find the FA's decision controversial, especially considering that the arch was illuminated blue and yellow after the invasion of Ukraine last year, in rainbow colours to support LGBT rights during the World Cup in Qatar, in red following terror attacks in Turkey in 2016, and in the colours of the French tricolour after the Paris terror attacks the previous year. When I was going through my script, and now I read this out, it just strikes me as so dreadful and disgraceful that considering where they've used colours before, the FA failed to recognise the murderous attacks in Israel. Why? And is it any surprise, in embarrassment and shame, the FA has since announced its new policy to stop lighting the arch in support of humanitarian causes, now only for sporting and entertainment purposes, and perhaps also for a coronation. They may, another coronation, be very long delayed. So let me turn to my panel. Nigel, it's not often that you're going through your script and you just can't believe the inconsistency, the appallingness, the weakness of the FA in not lighting up the arch in recognition of the attacks on Israel. Well, it's the inconsistencies, I think, that uh, are pushing them towards this decision to not, not do anything at all. Um, I think they're right. I think football should be about football and not politics. And inevitably, that you're going to find something that you support is going to be controversial. I mean, I support the new policy. I, I think the new policy is absolutely right. But I still can't quite get over that when 1,400 people were killed, considering all the other occasions when they'd done it, this was the one terror attack that they decided they would not show sympathy with... with there was with a minute, si minute silence um, for uh, the dead on both sides. Um, I think that this is actually a much more contentious issue. Where they should be, be going with if they decide to light up is if there is an event on British soil which ends up in uh, um, major casualties. I think that that's a, a point to do it. But to stay away from politics as much as possible, they ought to. And, and Nigel's right about that, isn't he? Staying away from politics if yeah, you're I, a, a, I, I, a sporting place is a good idea. I totally agree. I, I don't think anything but politics should be involved in politics, really. I mean, of course, if your business is affected by a political decision, then that's another matter. But, you know, we have so many businesses now that like to virtue signal well, on all kinds of issues, and then they end up being boycotted for stuff that they really just should have kept quiet and, about in the first place. And the England football team took the knee, didn't they? Yes. So they were well, all over okay. the, oh, the Marxist... Okay. No, it's I not think okay. that well, they supported it, the Marxist wrong. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> No, but I, they don't recognise a terror attack on Israel. Well, you can't well, think well, that's well, OK. Well, that, that, that minute silence that I was talking about, I mean, that was going on um, with, with um, football teams all over the place. The point I'm making is, if individual footballers want to make a political... Um, to, uh, show their political views, say they want to do a one-love armband, take the knee, that's a matter that, for them. But, but, no, but they're I... not allowed to, are they? That um, when they're... 
um, playing in the World Cup and so on. There are rules against expressing their political views for but exactly the reasons that it's so controversial. Yeah, but my argument is that, it, that they should be allowed to express their views. If we have a problem because they're playing in Qatar and we can't do that, that's a different matter. That, but the whole thing is that um, I'm saying but for But it was the England team. The England uh, manager was in favour of them taking the knee. Yes, well, um, but I, I, if That, the, that was a, that was a the, political decision of the group. It, well, if the individual is happy with that, if the individual wants to take the knee, that seems to me uh, fine to me. On the official end, which is... What the FA is, no, not so fine. They should keep out of the of the political debate. I think I think ultimately we, we we've seen Jacob very well well put out all the other reasons in which the, which the arch has been lit up, and then basically when push comes to shove, they said, oh, it's Jews that are dead. We're not going to do it. How I, does no, that I don't think that's fair. I, don't I think that's I, I think you, sorry, you were dealing with a hugely that, controversial Nigel. issue, uh, which made it much more difficult for them, and because. That no. caused so much trouble. Look, I mean, the, the FA did apologise to um, to Israelis for what they did. They actually sort of phoned them up yeah, and, and told I, them I that. I disagree. But All the reasons they've lit the arch are arguably controversial. Lighting well, up that's, after that's the why better terrorist not to do it at all. attacks might offend Muslims in this country. Lighting up after Ukraine is going to for Ukraine is going to uh, perhaps impact Russians in this country. All these things are political. I think you're right. Keep out of it altogether. We should agree on that. But that I, think, I think we all agree about <laughs> we agree that. On that yeah. But we're horrified. We're certainly two of us. Are horrified, horrified about the failure earlier. The well, thank you to my brilliant panel. Coming up, my book club is back with a bang because my next guest will be discussing one of his books on the infamous emperor of the French, Napoleon Bonaparte. Dangerous figure. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 pm. Is Britain a hotel for immigrants? I delve into the scandal that is our net migration figures alongside Daily Telegraph columnist Alison Pearson, who wants Rishi out. Plus, after I'm a celeb diva, Nella Rose clashed with Nigel Farage. Are young people ignorant on the issue of immigration? The Israeli government spokesperson responds after that bombshell Kay Burley interview. We'll bring you the latest big moment from Nigel's jungle journey and the most exciting paper review anywhere on the telly. Patrick Christie tonight, 9 to 11 pm. Be there. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, welcome back. We're going straight over to Theo Tricomba with some breaking news. Well, let's take you live to Dublin, where protesters are clashing with police. The riots began after three children and a woman were stabbed in an attack earlier today. GB News reporter Doogie Beatty is in the city centre. Doogie, what can you tell us? Well, it has, you're quite correct, this has sparked riots here. And that was mainly over Drew Harris, whether he was going to say it was an Irish national or not that, that actually carried out this attack on those children and women. And it, it has sparked off quite a lot of riots here tonight in Dublin. You can see the security here behind me uh, from the Garda Shia Khanna, the police force in the Republic of Ireland. They have been running battles through O'Connell Street tonight. There has been public toilet burnt here. There has been a police car set on fire and uh, there has been a lot of shops vandalised and so forth on the way down through. Now I'm at the top end of that at a place called Gardner Road. You can hear the helicopters going overhead here and it must be said that this has been simmering for probably about a year now and uh, it is uh, through a lack of uh, policies not put in place here by the government and unfortunately it has boiled over into this very incident right now. For now, Ruby, thank you very much. We'll have more on this developing story throughout the evening. Now back to Jacob. Well, th thank you very much. I'm really so pleased to be joined tonight by the book club by the best-selling author and historian uh, Lord Roberts of Belgravia, whose latest book titled Conflict, The Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine was co-authored with General David Petraeus and published in October. Lord Roberts has also written some brilliant biographies, most of which I'm glad to say I've either read or listened to on audiobooks. Lord Salisbury is his masterpiece, fantastic book on Churchill, a revision on George III, but perhaps most notably, Napoleon Buonaparte. Now, yesterday, Ridley Scott's new film, all about Buonaparte, was released into cinemas. So what exactly is it about this short French leader from a couple of hundred years ago that still captures the imagination of millions across the world? Well, um, the answer, I hope, will come from Lord Roberts. Um, Andrew, thank you for coming in. Look. You are a patriotic Englishman, and you've written biographies about great heroes of this nation. And then you write one about this awful scoundrel who is our <laughs> enemy. How could you? Um, first of all, can I uh, pick you up on the small? He wasn't small. He was exactly the same height as a normal Frenchman of the day. Well, you a normal Frenchman, but wasn't an him, Englishman. No, you called him infamous earlier. He wasn't. He was famous. <laughs> uh, and the fact is that, yes, we wouldn't have uh, wanted him here because he was a dictator, but he was desperately needed at the time of the French Revolution to end the sort of mad bits of the French Revolution. Revolution and to reform what was at the time a uh, an incompetent and and corrupt government. Okay, but he's quite brutal, isn't he? The the massacre at Jaffa is a serious blot on his copybook, and that he orders that the evidence is very clear. He writes letters commanding it, and what is it? Two to four thousand people get um, massacred. Somewhere between five hundred and two thousand, perhaps. They're Turkish artillerymen, essentially, who had given their parole not to fight against the French. Republic after they had been captured six weeks earlier. But not all of them. Um, Some of them have um, been captured more recently. The, the people who've had their parole have gone to another fort, haven't they? And then they join with other people. There are, there are, there are different and they, groups. They're all killed, right. yeah. And, and, and essentially he, uh, he executes them. Um, in a bit like the way that um, Admiral Nelson executed the Neapolitan Jacobins uh, in the... Um, but they were the traitors. <laughs> Absolutely. They were traitors but, to their sovereign. No, no. <laughs> um, a war crime's a war crime when it comes to... I don't think it is. I mean, I think, I think what Nelson was doing is completely different. And the scales much smaller. This, this, well, without 300 is, is still a significant number of, um, of, yes. of, uh, um, of poor old... Uh, um, I mean, you don't politics. mind the execution of the regicides, do you? The 
Um, which regicide? Well, the regicide's in 1660 when um, Charles II comes back. That was clearly a reasonable thing to do. That was fine. I'm, yeah, I'm, oh, good. I'm, okay. I'm all in favour of that. No, 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 don't worry. You, I don't think you can outmanoeuvre me on Toryism uh, here, genuinely. <laughs> well, I'm worried. Because, no, 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 because he is... Uh, first of all, he is French. He is taking over a country which is... In absolute desperate need. It's uh, under invasion, apart from anything else, from the Austrians and the Prussians. And this is what um, a lot of people seem to uh, to ignore or forget, um, which is that uh, it's a country at war. It's run by a directory which is um, utterly useless. It desperately needs completely new institutions. And in order to cut the Gordian knot, you need to have a dictator, okay. a benevolent dictator, for a short period of time. Benevolent is surely questionable. No, no, no. He, was, he starts off, until he's invaded and attacked um, again and again by the Allied powers. Uh, remember, of the seven wars of the coalition, he only starts two of them. The other five are started by the coalition. But he wants to have a continental system against uh, the UK, which understandably we want to stop. He has plans to uh, invade England. Um, the... Absolutely. And, and Russia. Of course, and Russia. So the two the two wars he starts in 1808 in the peninsula and 1812 in Russia both are intended to try and strangle our trade. And on both occasions, of course, he um, he comes a cropper. And those are the two wars he started. But the other wars, the many many other wars, the other five wars of the coalition, are not his fault. So he can't be blamed. Like this movie blames him essentially for being some kind of Hitlerian figure that uh, that just uh, starts well, he, war he invades war. the papal state. He steals things from the Vatican. He imprisons the Pope. I mean, he is a bad man. The stealing from the Vatican, though, uh, I know... He, I mean, he obviously, does. I no, mean, no, no. He, yes, I know, but what's the British them. Museum? What's the British Museum if it's not things that we've... We haven't from stolen things countries? from the Vatican. The, um, you're speaking now as a Catholic, of <laughs> course. That's always true. Well, exactly. I mean, had, it, had it been from a, from a Protestant museum, <laughs> I wonder whether or not you'd be so excited about it, uh, Jacob. But, um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean... This is the 18th century. People took um, booty in a way. It was part of, of warfare. Rather like, by the way, the, uh, the killing of the, of the uh, prisoners at Jaffa. You know, the Middle East had different style of warfare, and it was the 18th century, and a lot of those people had promised not to um, uh, raise arms against the French Republic. But they do say, the Ottomans do say after Jaffa, that they won't trust him again, don't they? That they do think it is a serious breach of the code of war. Well, a lot that often happens. You know, you see this, and, and actually, um, thank you for mentioning my book, uh, Conflict, because in that we also see that if you break the rules of law, very often it comes back to uh, to haunt you. Well, um, indeed, and it certainly haunted him. And eventually, he loses at Waterloo, um, goes to Saint Helena. And we can be quite pleased about that, can't we? Uh, that we, we get rid of a tyrant. Of course, we can be we can be very pleased that we won the Battle of Waterloo. Absolutely, I mean, you know, as you say, I'm a patriotic Englishman. Of course, I want Wellington win to win that battle. Um, but what happens afterwards? France goes straight back into a uh, an appalling sort of Bourbon monarchy where they uh, they they remember nothing and, and forget it, nothing. It'd been better off if we'd won the Hundred Years' War. Anyway, thank you very much to um, <laughs> Andrew. If you want to learn more about this, listen to the Napoleonic Quarterly on a podcast. It's absolutely brilliant and I would strongly recommend it. Uh, coming up next, it's the weather. I'll be back on Monday. I'm Jake rees -Mogg. This has been State of the Nation and I'm driving down to Somerset where I know, even though by the time I get there, it'll be midnight, the sun will be metaphorically shining and the weather will be glorious. Evening, I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. The wind's picking up out there, a blustery and cold day tomorrow, but most places will see some sunny spells. The reason for the change, a cold front is pushing south. Ahead of it, still quite mild. Behind it, very windy and much colder air arriving. So strong the winds, we actually have a Met Office yellow warning in place across Shetland, but across Orkney and the northeast of the mainland, very blustery with wintry showers coming in here, a little bit of snow is possible. A little bit of rain will clear away from England and Wales. Most places will be dry. Uh, turning pretty chilly, but temperatures holding up in the southwest. But actually here during tomorrow, temperatures will tend to fall away. We'll start with cloud and still some patchy rain over maybe North Wales. Some showers just hitting parts of Aberdeenshire and then the east coast of England, especially Norfolk, seeing the odd shower. But for most places, it's dry. For many, it'll be fine and sunny, but it uh, ain't going to be warm with temperatures in single figures, a chilly day and feeling particularly cold in the east with this brisk wind. 
That wind will only slowly ease during Saturday, but it should ease away, as will any showers just hitting the eastern side of England. And for most, Saturday is also set fair. Yes, there'll be a, a frosty start, but then plenty of autumn sunshine uh, lifting the temperatures to between a four and eight. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? <laughs> I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you? <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth. I don't, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good evening and welcome to Patrick Christie's Tonight. <laughs> People take to the streets in Dublin saying enough is enough. After children were stabbed near a school, we will have all of the latest on a tinderbox of a situation. We're monitoring that one very, very closely. Also, the net migration figures are out and they are a disgrace. We're taking part in a giant mass migration Ponzi scheme that is leaving Britain on the brink. Plus, after Nella did this to Nigel last night. But this is what I was saying it, to you. Apparently you're anti-immigrants. And you're... Who told you that? Oh, Who the internet. Told... The oh, internet. well, there. Mm, well, I ask, are young people totally ignorant on immigration? Anne Widdicombe hits back at claims that Brexiteers are thick, and I speak to the man who nearly broke the internet today after making mincemeat of Kay Burley. On my sofa tonight, Alison Pearson, who is furious at the net migration numbers, Lord Bailey and Amy Nicole Turner. It's Patrick Christie tonight, and we're going in strong. Write to me now, gbviews at gbnews.com. Your politicians have ignored you on immigration, but I won't. Unleash to me in the inbox. Twitter is at gbnews. I'll see you after your headlines with Theo.
I'm Theo Chikomba in the GB Newsroom. We begin with some breaking news. Riots have broken out in Dublin after three children and a woman were stabbed just